Citroën finally arrives in India. All the details on what cars are coming and everything else you want to know. The Royal Enfield Trials Bullet 500. We have the review. And we go across to Sweden to tell you the latest that's happening with Volvo and safety. It is a brand new week and the temperature is soaring. But guess what? Our content is also looking pretty scorching hot. There is a lot to take you through because there's big news and there's some very cool new products and some great technology. Lots of nice combinations then to take you through, like I said. You've had a glimpse of it already, so we'll jump straight into it. Citroën, the French car maker that belongs to the PSA Peugeot Citroën Group, is the first brand that will debut from PSA here in India. Now that part was made official quite some time back, but it was the first time that there was a public outing of that brand and its management in India. Now, a few weeks ago, we from the Geneva Motor Show got you a little bit of insight from the CEO of Citroen, that's uh, Linda Jackson. And at the time, we also told you that the first product for India is the C5 Aircross SUV. Now, so much more that we know beyond that and also a chance to get up close with the man who runs the entire group, Carlos Tavares. Citroën. Citroën. That's uh, possibly as French as it can get. I'm sure I'm not getting it right. But in English, Citroën. It's not Citron, it's not Citron. And you have to get used to it, folks, because yes, the brand is coming. And I'll get into more about that in just a second, but let's get that right, shall we? Sit, like I'm doing right now. Row, like row your boat. And uh, let me unlock my phone. N. Citroën. So, get used to saying that. I'm sure you can practice it and get it right. Now, the car first coming to us will be this one, the C5, and uh, the Air Cross is the very latest and the flagship from the brand in Europe as well. A compact SUV, but one which is full of significant attributes, and so uh, expect it to be positioned in that sort of Jeep Compass kind of range. But it's what happens from there on, which is going to be the more interesting part of the story. Three products, 2021, 22, and 23, that will come one year at a time, but new products that don't currently exist in Citroen's lineup anywhere in the world, and products that are going to be developed, keeping India in mind, but with an export potential. So there you go, the first point, from word go, exports, very key. And guess what, it's already begun. The gearboxes that are being made here locally are already being shipped and used in Europe. It's going to be the same for components. The sourcing strategy in India is not just for India, but helps make the Indian operation even more aggressive and therefore cost competitive. The third point, even the engines made here, and then of course the cars that are going to be made here, which will also be exported. 100,000 capacity to start with for Citroen, and uh, that's conservative. And yet with that, the brand is planning to target about 2% of the Indian market. So of course, it says we're happy to go higher than that, but not typically what you hear. Brands come in and talk about 5-10% market share. Staying conservative is going to be part of the profitability promise from Citroen here in India. And that's the part that is very dear and central to that plan as Carlos Tavares, the uh, group CEO for uh, PSA, shared with me. If we consider that we have in uh, India a uh, competitive supplier base, uh, it is quite clear that if you start sourcing parts in India, exporting for the rest of the world, the cost reductions that you are going to create are already paying for the local investments eventually that you'll have to do. If I take the example of our uh, powertrain plant uh, in Osur, uh, basically, this investment is already paid by the cost reductions that we are able to generate compared to other sourcings in the world, which then means that by itself, this specific investment is self-sustained. So I'll put it there. And at the same time, I'm going to use it to make a deep localization for the products I want to manufacture in India for the Indian market. In the same way, if I start by saying yes 
to my people telling me, we want a big uh, greenfield plant. I said, no, I want a small brownfield, brownfield plant. It was going to be much less investment at the beginning, but then I will keep my business plan in the black, and if it is successful, of course, I'm going to saturate the plant. I will make another one. So what that means is scalability and keeping a low break-even point with the frugal investments at the beginning gives you a much longer-term perspective because then you go step by step, but you always keep your operations in the black. So those are two examples, and of course, if I don't spend here 200 expatriates, it will also reduce my cost. So I want to use my local Indian talent to make things uh, even more efficient. It's a, a long list of things you can do to keep things uh, aligned. Uh, it's not easy, of course, and we don't always succeed. From time to time we fail, from time to time we succeed. But at least I think we have a very Indian vision of frugality and scalability that is the best way to plan for the long term. So big plans from Citroën. Now we talk about the Royal Enfield Trials bike. Now a lot of you may not know about this or maybe many of you do. The name, the trials, well that comes from actual automotive trials that used to take place in the 40s and 50s. A lot of the Royal Enfield bikes were involved in that. And so it's a nice little nostalgic tribute or nod to that heritage. And yes, of course, that means the bike looks pretty special too. It's based on the Bullet 500, but it goes so much further. Heritage, nostalgia, legacy. These are pillars on which Royal Enfield is built upon as a brand. And one such legacy was the company's continued success in international trials competition in the 1940s and 50s. It was yet another opportunity for the brilliant marketing boffins at Royal Enfield to create a new segment of motorcycles. Enter. Royal Enfield Bullet Trials Work Replica 500. So what exactly is the Trials 500? Well, it has been derived from the Bullet 500 and is a retro-styled scrambler. There is a minimalist design theme with an exposed frame painted in khaki green. The rest of the bodywork is painted in silver with dollops of chrome. Then of course you have the single seat and upswept exhaust front telescopic forks, wearing rubber gaiters, dual-purpose SEAT tyres, a factory-fitted luggage rack and an assortment of accessories such as a metal mesh headlamp protector, an engine guard, a bash plate and a cover for the handlebar brace. So yes, Royal Enfield managed to create a brand new motorcycle out of an existing one by slapping on some off-road bits. The overall look could be called quirky at best and we believe only the staunchest Royal Enfield aficionados will agree to it being called a showstopper. The Trials 500 uses the same 499cc single-cylinder fuel-injected motor as on the Bullet 500, pumping out 27.2 brake horsepower at 5250 rpm and churns out a peak torque of 41.3 Nm at 4000 rpm. The gearbox too remains the same, clunky 5-speed unit which at times had a mind of its own. The front telescopic forks have a 35mm diameter and a travel of 130 mm. At the rear are the twin gas charge shock absorbers having a travel of 80 mm. Both ends get disc brakes with dual channel ABS that cannot be switched off. We have been riding the Royal Enfield Trials 500 all day long and I haven't had so much fun in the longest time. So the press ride of the Trials 500 was designed to give us a feel of how a trials event is conducted. So we rode our motorcycles through three trials sections, each more difficult than the other. Also we had a timed lap and of course the Trials 500, it shone brightly. This motorcycle can go through everything that you throw at it. It's been an absolute hoot. And of course, it's designed to go off-road. 
we were primarily riding off road and that is where the royal enfield trials did well enough to get us grinning inside our helmet sure it was not a hardcore off road bike but it doesn't shy away from the rough stuff either it had the typical vibrations that you would expect of a bullet 500 We did have a few houses with the Royal Enfield Trials 500. Firstly, standing up and riding proved to be a task because the fuel tank is fat and bulbous, and locking your knees onto the tank is near impossible because of the smooth metal. The bite from the brakes is dull, and there is no progression. This kind of robs you of confidence when you're riding off road and need to stop quickly. Plus, a switchable ABS. would have sweetened the deal further this has been a very different and a very refreshing media ride there were no open roads to test the performance and handling of the motorcycle but then the trial section did reveal a fair bit there's like bucket loads of low end torque which means this can pull through any obstacle it can plow through any course and of course the suspension is tuned to take a beating It doesn't shy away from tough terrain, rocks, potholes, craters, nothing at all. Nothing phases the suspension on this motorcycle. The Royal Enfield Trials 500 and the 350 did not need massive resources in terms of R&D and with a few new parts, nice paint job along with decent off-road ability, the company has churned out an enthusiast's motorcycle. although a little more thought into the design could have worked wonders and made the motorcycle palatable to a larger set of audiences One name that's for years been synonymous with safety undoubtedly is Volvo and that's one brand that therefore almost has an onus on itself to stay at the cutting edge of technology and safety equipment and it's no different with what's happening right now okay so lots of ands done the point being that uh, the very latest that's happening at Volvo when it comes to safety is stuff that you might have thought is science fiction not so long ago Ame and I spent some time in Gothenburg at the Volvo headquarters to bring you this. Car makers are now bound by government regulations to make safer cars, right from structure to active and passive safety features. But there's one manufacturer who's been at the top of the safety game from the word go. And in fact, its name is synonymous with safety yes we are talking about volvo and in fact it is an innovation that we are specifically talking about from 1959 that has saved more than a million lives well sitting right here you might think that i am a dummy too but really i'm not i'm here to celebrate 60 years of an innovation that has been pioneered by Volvo it's a very simple thing to do now a compulsory thing to do now all around the world and it is this the three point uh, seat belt and it's been here in the industry for all these years but Volvo has been the innovator and the major driver of pushing this in cars to make it compulsory just to make sure that fatalities are less and another initiative that is taken now is the EVA initiative where the company which has done all the research of all was entire research for from all these years about uh, safety in cars about how accidents uh, happen and how accidents uh, create a lot of problems with uh, for human beings all that has been now documented and will be available for uh, other manufacturers i think it's an initiative which needs to be saluted and all this now in the public forum will only make things better and yes that's the vision 2020 and volvo is bringing to the table the 
Eva initiative will help companies gain access to the knowledge base that Volvo has developed over the course of many years from the studies of accidents and the victims too which has helped immensely in building cars which have a safe cabin and keeps the occupants safe too and it's now better packaged uh, if you look at uh, what is happening, it's easy to uh, lose the perspective of uh, the knowledge we have. It has happened several times that we have had uh, people coming to Volvo Cars and they have been asking questions about our research. And uh, they have not known that we have already released important research reports yeah. since a long time before. So now we ha as a, uh, make this EVA as a statement to uh, present it to the rest of the community that say, and say that this is actually the data we have that uh, could give you the perspective of equalness out in traffic. So that is the message out. We have the data and it's accessible in a clustered, structured way. And it's studies like these that have helped Volvo make a bold statement. The company says that by 2020, no one will be seriously injured or killed in a Volvo. Yes, it will be that safe. In fact, the company has already announced that it will cap the top speed of its cars to 180 km per hour, which sees it take a bold step when it comes to the automotive industry worldwide. The company is even inviting car makers from all over the globe to join this 180 club. But there's a bigger war to be fought and this time around the company has taken aim at addressing the issues of intoxication and distraction. To address this issue the company is installing in-car cameras and other sensors that monitor the driver. But here what we're, we're looking at is is a three-stage approach where you have a support phase where you have information warning and, and corrective behaviors or shielding of corrective behaviors, braking and steering in the first phase. And, and if that uh, isn't enough, what happens is that the vehicle can be reducing the speed. So the ve vehicle can reduce speed and the Volvo on call can uh, discuss with the driver uh, uh, what's going on. Some people have consequences based off of strokes or other medical conditions or drugs that are uh, prescription drugs but alcohol is the main contributor and and if if that's not enough we we're able to give, give the vehicle the uh, authority to to stop the vehicle in the end introduction of the cameras on all Volvo models will start on the next generation of the scalable SPA 2 vehicle platform in the early 2020s. Details on the exact amount of cameras and their positioning in the interior will follow at a later stage. Currently though, in the test car vehicle, the cameras are placed on the A pillar. But with all these active and passive safety features, are people going to become over-reliant on technologies? Uh, the issue of over-reliance, of course, is an issue due to the fact that if we, as humans, think that a system can do something that it's not designed to do, uh, we might start trusting it and you come to a situation where you actually need to intervene. You may not be as prepared as you need to be in that particular situation. So over-reliance um, could, historically it was when, with ABS brakes, um, you thought that you could go much, much faster because you had the ABS brakes. Uh, front wheel drive, all wheel drive, um, you don't have to drive as carefully on winter roads because you have all wheel drive, which is actually not the intention of the system. It's there to help you get even better uh, than, than, uh, than you were with the other, with the other system. So what we do is we, we've done a lot of research to, to, un, to work on understanding the human nature and the human brain and what the mechanisms are for you uh, detaching from the task of driving and what the mechanisms are for keeping you in the driving and finding the right balance between support but at the same time making sure that you understand that the car is actually not more capable than it is. 
But of course, with cars getting smarter, reliance on technology cannot be avoided and so a fine balance is the need of the hour, especially with autonomous technology hitting the roads very soon. At the end of the day though, it all boils down to how safe the cabin is and to demonstrate this, Volvo crash tested the 2020 XC90. We at CNB have brought you countless results of crash tests and told you how it all unfolds too. But who would refuse a front seat to how it's all done, right? With preparations taking more than a day, the XC90 charged towards the barrier at 80 km an hour and in a split second, it was all over. And as I said, it all happened in a split second. And that's what, you ha that's what happens on roads. I mean, the decision to drive the car and then you know, it's not in your hands, it's not in anyone else's hands. And that's what safety at Volvo is all about. At the Volvo Safety Center, it's all about making sure that the cars are safe to drive. And well, look at it, it's, it's totaled the car completely, but the structural integrity of the car is still intact. Of course, we don't know the results yet because it's only for Volvo and their database. It also begs to differ the question whether or not the cap that Volvo has put in of 180 kilometers per hour on all their cars, does that make sense now? There's a lot more happening behind closed doors at Volvo and we'll see the chapters unfold very soon. As far as safety is concerned, Volvo's Vision 2020 is a radical movement and one in the right direction. And with that, it's a wrap on today's program. Please react to it. Please always tell us what you'd like to see. And of course, promise me you'll wear your seatbelts and helmets. Join us next week.